Anybody remember what we preached this morning? Joshua. It's from Joshua. That's closer than I expected that we'd get. Does anybody else remember more so what we preached this morning? Walking around Jericho. Oh, you got to let him speak. He might be the only one that listens. Well, the good news is we're not going to preach that again tonight. Had you going for a minute, though, didn't I? You thought we was going to be back along the same lines. You might have thought we was going to figure up or uh, uh, finish up with what happened to Aiken and, and going on that route. And we thought about it, and that's initially what I would started studying up for. But God changed my mind uh, this evening. So we're going to go to one of my favorite books of the Bible, and we're going to begin preaching from there. We're going to be in the book of Proverbs. That's where we will begin. And what we're going to be talking about is how we are attracted to things. We're attracted to the way things look. But the way things look are not always what they are. Amen? Amen. And the devil uses that. The devil uses that to our advantage because he knows that one of our greatest weaknesses is our eyes. We're not much different than Samson. The only difference between us and Samson is that we ain't got strength in our hair. But our weakness comes from our eyes, and we begin to look at things. And if you open up your Bibles, the book of Proverbs, chapter 7, that's where we're going to begin. And many of you, if, you are, if you're familiar with the book of Proverbs, or if you've already got your Bible flipped over there and you read that, you're going to think we're going to be preaching it from a, in a different aspect. You're going to think we're going to preach it from a, not just about things, because as it reads, it reads of a woman. But this is also, I believe, could be compared to the woman that spoke of in Revelations. May not be. But there's a good comparison between the two. If you want to have a fun study sometimes, study the likes between the two of them and the harlot that is spoken of throughout the book of Proverbs and in different places through there and the great whore that you'll read about in Revelations. There's some similarities there. Some of that similarity is what we're going to touch on today, tonight, this evening. However you just want to phrase it. Proverbs chapter 7 beginning... Well, let's just back up and we'll just begin in verse 4 just for the fun of it. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. They that may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. There, therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us, fill of, let us take our fill of love until the morning, let us solace ourselves with, with loves. For the good man is not at home, he has gone on a long, long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hastes to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine, thine heart decline to her ways, 
go not astray in her paths, for she cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you again here today, Father, we're just so thankful for this another opportunity, Lord, to gather together in your house and in your name. Father, we're thank you for, thankful for your word. We're thankful for the instruction that lies in it. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for giving us the instruction in which we need to get, carry uh, forth our day-to-day -day lives, Father. And we're just thankful, Lord, that through each and every passage of Scripture, Lord, that we can find your Holy Spirit can interpret what you would have us to know through it. Father, we ask you, Lord, to uh, meet with us as we are here at Oakdale here tonight. Father, we just ask you, Lord, to bless each and every one of us. Father, we just ask you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, Lord, just to send upon each and every one of us here, just to allow us to interpret your word in the manner in which you, you, you know the hearts, you know the needs of each person that's here. Father, we just ask you, Lord, to apply the word, Lord, to each heart the way that you see fit for it to. Father, we just ask you, Lord, just to stand with me, to give me the knowledge, the wisdom, and the courage, Lord, to be able to preach what you'd have me to preach. And Father, I just pray, Lord, that if I begin to get in the way, Father, you could just sit me down and have your way with our service. Father, we ask all these things in your Son, Christ Jesus' name, and amen. And as we begin reading right here, again, as you read through this, you're thinking of a woman, you're thinking of prostitution, you're thinking of a man, you're thinking of someone after lust, you're thinking of someone who's just, who has seen a pretty woman, and a pretty woman just uh, uh, sucked herself into the man and began to entice him in different ways, and that's the way it reads, and that's what Solomon is, is talking to his sons about here, but we're going to look at this in a different aspect. We're going to look at that, that woman, that harlot, we're going to look at that as being Satan and the way that she does that is because Satan is not in his house. House. Satan is not where he belongs yet. He is still out. He is still trying. To, he tempts us in, in all the different ways in which he can. And the main way that he does this is with his eye, with our eyes. He makes things look uh, uh, pleasing to us. He makes things look nice. He makes them look like it's not that bad. And when we begin to, to stub up, when we begin to say, no, that's not right, Satan. I don't need to do that. He says, well, hey, hey, God ain't going to see it. God ain't there. You're not in God's house. There ain't none of your Christian family here. It says here in 19, it says, the good man is not at home for he's gone on a long journey. Hey, Christ has gone on a long journey. Amen. He's went to prepare a place for us. Yeah. But he's coming back. And we don't know when, do we? Amen. And lo and behold, the Bible says some of us will be ashamed at his coming. Amen. Amen. Some of us are going to be ashamed at what we're doing because some of us are going to be laying in the harlot's bed, ain't we? Some of us are going to be laying there knee deep in sin. Some of us are going to be standing knee deep in sin. Some of us are going to be dirty. Our hands will be dirty with sin. Our hearts are going to be dirty with sin. All because the devil made it look pleasing to us. Does the Bible not teach us that we can enjoy sin for a season? It don't specify whether they're talking to the sinner or to the saved, do they? But the Bible says you can enjoy sin for a season. Anybody got a wildlife calendar at home? Deer season's approaching. Bow season's going on. Juvenile deer season should be next weekend. Muzzle loader's going to open the weekend after that. Then it'll be time me and Bubba can get the dogs out and we can go rabbit hunting. We're ready for that season, ain't we? We look forward to seasons. My favorite one's turkey season. I like to turkey hunt. You know what season you won't find on the calendar? When you can enjoy sin. You won't find the, the two weeks in, on the calendar that says you may enjoy sin now. You won't necessarily find specific dates in the Bible. But you will find that you can enjoy sin for a season. And you'll also find that the wages of sin is death. Amen. You will find that. And consequential to death, there is one or two places that you will go. And it's heaven or hell. Amen. There's no other place. My Bible does not speak of any other place in which you will go. It does in the Old Testament. Yes, there's a place called Abraham's bosom. That's nothing like purgatory. That's not what that is. That's not a place that you go that you may be able to redeem. That was for the Old Testament saints. Amen. Since Jesus is coming and since his death and crucifixion and resurrection, now there's two places. There's heaven and there's hell. Ain't no in-betweens. Ain't no in-betweens. And right now, we're just stuck here on earth. And while we're stuck here, we have things that we have to do daily. Amen. We have to work. We have to 
take care of our families. We have, some of what we farm, there's different things that we have to do. We don't have to sin. That's chosen. Amen. You may not agree with that and you may not believe that, but sin is chosen. You choose to sin. You choose whether you live your life in sin or whether you live your life to be as righteous as you can be in the sight of God. We can't never be as righteous as we ought to be, but we should strive for that. We should strive for perfection. Amen? How is it that you do that? By reading and studying. Amen. We go over this every single Sunday night. Eventually, I'm going to ask that and somebody's going to answer me. By reading and studying God's Word. For out the window of my house, I looked through my casement. And beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding. How many of us are void of understanding? Preacher, I ain't void of understanding. I come to church. I'm here every single time the door is open. I agree. You might, but are you void of understanding? Do you not fully understand God's word? Because if this is the only place you hear it, the odds are you're probably void of understanding of the majority of if this is the only time that you attempt to read it or hear it, it's here at church, it ain't enough. It must be done in the home. That's the primary spot in which Bible reading and studying should take place is in your home. And if that's not happening, odds are you are void of understanding. That does not mean that you are lost. That means that you don't fully understand God's law and God's commandments. That means that you are more apt and more susceptible to be living in sin than one who sits and studies all the time. So preacher, you're telling me if I study more that I'm going to sin less. No. No, I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you that you will know when you're sinning then. Amen. You will know that you're sinning then. And you'll be better prepared how to avoid it. Let me find it. First Corinthians ten thirteen. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Some of us want to take that to the literal extremes. And I believe that when temptation arises, God will present a door of exit. Amen. But if you read and study that further, and you go back and you begin studying the, the, the Greek words that are used there, you will also find that in that verse... It tells you by you going back to the original text in which it, which it was written and from what it was translated from that it means that you will land intact on the other side of temptation. You will not fall broken from temptation. It means that you have a place to land when you come into temptation. There is a place to land. You know where that place to land is? Your knees. You get to land on your knees. You get to land in Christ's arms. That for, therefore, when temptation comes and we fall to it, because odds are we fall to it more than we resist it. Amen? Amen? I know I'm not the only person in the church house that has this problem. When temptation comes, you find yourself giving in to it rather than standing against it. But when that happens, I have a place that I can fall, and it is my knees, it is Calvary, it is Jesus' arms. I have a place that I can go to where I can find rest and comfort. You folks can pat me on the back and say, brother, we love you, and it's going to be okay. You can tell me that all you want to, but you can't fix it. But my Jesus can. He can pat me on the back. He say, it's going to be okay. I forgive you. Don't do that no more. Turn away from those things. Repent. Come unto me. I'll give you understanding. If you ask for it, I will give it to you. If you knock, I'll open it for you. Is that not what the book teaches us in Luke? Is that not where you find that? You ask him for understanding, he'll give it to you. You ask him to show you sin in your life, put your seatbelt on because it's going to be a wild ride. You're going to find things there. Amen. But you've got to put forth effort too. You've got to put your face down in this. 
I beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. Now, now we're speaking to you older Christians. We're speaking to you ones who, who can withstand temptation a little bit better. Maybe sometimes you see younger Christians and they're, they're going around that corner where you know temptation lies because you've been down that road before. You've been on that street. You've been on that corner. And you know exactly where they're at. You remember what we said part of your job as a Christian was this morning? To hold up Moses' arms, right? Your job is to be there. You can give them correction. You can give them advice. You can tell them to steer clear of that corner. They might not take it. But if you're strong enough to withstand it, then you can go with them. And you can be there for them. Because especially for the young Christians, it's much harder for them to withstand temptation. Amen. What does the book of Ephesians tell us that we wrestle with? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle against Satan and his demons. That's who we wrestle with. And if you want to know the truth of the matter, we don't usually get our hands in that fight. That's God winning that fight for us. If we let him. If we. We let him. We have to lean on him when temptation comes. You flip over to the book of Matthew, beginning in the fourth chapter. Uh, I want to say it's about uh, maybe 1 through 11 through there is when you'll find the temptation of Jesus. What did he use to withstand temptation every single time? Does he not begin the, 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 his answer with, For it is written. It is written in my Father's word. It is written in God's word. When temptation comes, if you have your face in the Bible enough and you can see that, you can say, hey, I just read that last week. It is written in God's Word that I ain't to do that. It is written that it is okay for me to call upon Jesus to help me. It is written that it is okay that I can call among the elders and I can get help from them. It is written that there is safety in numbers. Of counselors. You'll find that here in the same book. Amen. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot, and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Anybody stepped outside lately and hear the devil roaring? Of course, you've not figuratively. But can you not see the devil roaring when you turn on the news? You can't see him being the main thing that is talked about on the news. I know you don't watch a different news channel than I do because every time you turn on news channel 2, 4, or 5, or even Fox 17 at night, somebody got shot, somebody got stabbed, somebody did this. It is all hatred. And hatred don't come from my God. Hatred comes from the devil. You cannot tell me that Satan ain't roaring as loud now as he's ever roared before in our world. He is here. And it is time for us to stand up and fight against him. It is time for us to resist. What does the Bible teach us about Satan? If you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Is that not what the Bible teaches? Is he still bothering you? Then resist him. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Would it not just be easier? Would it not just be easier if we was a little bit more like Samson? What do you mean, preacher? Well, maybe we didn't have eyes. We couldn't see how good these things look. Maybe we didn't have ears, and then we couldn't hear nothing about it either. It'd be very easy for me one-on-one -on -one spiritually at that point, wouldn't it? Why? Because there'd be no other distraction. There wouldn't be nothing to hinder us between serving God and listening to Him and talking to Him, right? You think about that just for a moment. If you couldn't see nothing and you couldn't hear nothing, You'd still hear God speak to you. Amen. How, easy, how much easier would it be to be a Christian at that point? It'd be a lot easier. It would be a lot easier. You wouldn't have to see these things that look uh, pleasing. 
And I don't know, I don't know what your weakness is. I truly don't. If it's like this young man here that's spoken about in Proverbs, it might be women. It might be good-looking men, good-looking women, whatever it is. If you couldn't see it, you wouldn't have that problem. If you're an alcoholic, if we sewed your mouth shut, you wouldn't have to worry about wanting to drink, would you? You get literal with God, and He could get literal with you. Careful on how you ask God to help you, because I might caution you that sometimes you'll get more than what you bargained for. If you say, God, whatever it takes to get this sin out of my life, be prepared for whatever it might take. I don't want to prevent anyone from praying, but I will caution you. You ask God for help, and he'll give you help. His ways are more than our ways. Amen? She is loud and stubborn, and her feet abide not in her house. The devil goes to and fro wherever he wants to go. He'll go there. You ain't afraid of going to church house? He'll be there too. He'll meet you there. And he'll make sure that you take nothing away from the sermon. He'll make sure that you get nothing from God's word. Holy Spirit will be in this here trying to interpret for you. And the devil's going to be in this here. That guy don't know what he's talking about. He's talking to you. You might as well go and start getting mad. You might as well start getting stubborn. So what? He don't need to talk to you that way. He don't know what's going on in your life. He knows nothing about you. I don't, but Jesus does. Amen. He knows your heart and he knows what's going on. You can hide it from me all day long and I don't care. I'll still pray for you, but you ain't hiding from Jesus. I don't care how dark the street is. I don't care if there ain't no street lights there. You will not hide from Jesus. Amen. Now she is without, now on the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. Don't think for a minute the devil ain't waiting on you. Don't think for a moment that he ain't got a plan ready to crush your day and your week starting tomorrow. Don't think that he don't know you. He knows you. He knows your weakness. And he knows what will make you fall. Or at least he thinks he does. But I caution you, he knows Jesus too. The Bible teaches that he knows him. His demons know him. They called him by name. The Bible teaches you that, don't it? It teaches that they are afraid of him. It says that in here. Take Jesus with you. What does the Bible say? We, we just read about what we wrestle with in Ephesians. And that leads into the full armor of God. Do you ever put it on? Granted, I bet nobody walks out their house going to work naked. You put clothes on. Because you can't go outside naked. It's wrong. It ain't right. You'll go to jail. Amen? Everybody look at me and nod because you can't do that. Christians, why are we walking around naked? It's wrong. It ain't right, and we shouldn't do that. It's the same difference. Christians, you put on a little bit more clothing than everybody else. You put on that full armor of God on a daily basis because you need it. Because the one day that you forget your breastplate of righteousness or your sword of your spirit, the one day you forget that, that's the day that the devil's going to jump out from around that corner and he's going to get you. Amen. And he'll get you down before you even realize that he's there. So she caught him and kissed him. And that'd be a surprise, wouldn't it? Imagine with me, if you will, a young man walking down the street. And there's a pretty woman jumps out and plants one right in your lips. Take you by surprise, wouldn't it? That definitely gets your attention. Then she starts telling you everything you want to hear. I was looking for you. You're the person I wanted to see. Flatter you. We went back up into verse 5, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger with flattereth with her words. Tell you everything you want to hear. And then after that, they'll tell you that, hey, my husband ain't even home. He's gone away on a journey. And I've got a bedroom set up for you. That would get a young man's attention, would it not? It's there. You can sit there and look at me and the devil's going to be telling you that preacher don't let be standing up there talking about sex from the pulpit. Hey, it's in the Bible. You stay with me. You keep your mind out of the gutter and you don't let the devil get in your heart. You keep letting Jesus speak to you. Amen. That will get a man's attention. And what will he do? He'll fall every time. And it don't have to be a woman. It does not have to be a woman. 
Women, you're not exempt from this either. You can fall the exact same way. It don't have to be sexual things that makes you fall. It can be things of any sort. Anything whatsoever. Wherever there is a crack in your Christian life, the devil will find its way through. Anybody here other than myself afraid of snakes? There's a few of us. You can seal your house up as tight as you want to get it. But if you've got a crack in your house, within one quarter of an inch, a snake can get in it. Did you know that? That's not a very big crack, is it? That's small. That's very small. That's smaller than the very tip end of your finger. And a snake can get through that. But you think you're safe because you're in a house. You've got a steel door. You keep your windows closed down. You are protected, but it just takes that itty bitty crack and your worst fear can be in your house. Now if a snake come in my house, my mom will back me up. I put a for sale sign in my yard the next day and I never go back in there. And I ain't lying. I wouldn't do it. There was a chicken snake got in my garage one time and I called my daddy and I was panicked. I was out of breath. Couldn't even, just barely even talk to him. And he, he was out of my granny's at the time and he run as hard and fast as he'd go to the house because he just knew something bad had happened to me and you're one of the kids. And he gets out there and I'm standing there with a 10 foot piece of PVC pipe in one hand and a 40 caliber pistol in the other hand. And I'm standing just like this in my driveway. And he says, son, what on earth are you doing? I said, dad, there's a snake in the garage. He said, well, put the gun down, dummy, before you hurt somebody. Those were his words. I was scared plumb to death. Did not know what to do other than call dad. We found the snake. We didn't, dad did. And he killed it and he got it out of the house or out of the garage. And I was panicked because we were safe in our house. Those things shouldn't be there. Those things shouldn't be able to get in there. You may think you're safe in a church house, but let me tell you, there's cracks in a church house too. Amen. Satan can still get in and all it takes is one weak member for Satan to destroy an entire strong congregation. Did you know that? A chain is as strong as its weakest link. Amen? Amen? We are a chain, church. We are a chain of God's people. And if there's a weak one in the bunch, we all need to strengthen it. Because if that chain breaks, guess what happens? The devil can come in and can destroy your entire chain. And if you're separated, if a house is divided, it can't stand, can it? The Bible teaches you that. Amen? It's in the Word. Therefore I came forth to meet thee dil diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works and fine linen. linen. I perfume my bed with myrrh, owls, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. For the good man is not at home. He is on a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come at, a day, at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. That is the key. That is the key right there with her much fair speech. Because the devil ain't going to give you one line and be done. Some of us, that's all it takes is that one line and we're already fell hook, line, and sinker. It don't take much for the devil to get some of us to fall. But the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. We were talking about busting wood this morning. Anyone has ever bust wood? I know some of you older ones have. Most of them. Ryan, I know you ain't. Right? That involves work and sweat and possibly a blister. You ever get a piece of wood that you just can't bust? Boy, you'll swing that bust and hammer at it and you'll hit it several times and finally you'll get mad and you'll, cast, you'll just kick it to the side. You ain't going to mess with it no more. You ain't wasting no more of your energy on a piece of wood that won't bust, right? Maybe you need to become a really hard piece of hickory or oak. Maybe you need to not crack. Maybe you need to not splinter. Because as long as you can bust the wood out of this stack, you're going to keep on pulling from it, ain't you? You're going to swing out a hammer as long as you can swing and you're just going to keep on busting. You'll make headway that way, won't you? The devil ain't an idiot. He knows that too. If he can't bust you, the Bible says you resist him and he will flee. Amen? Amen. 
Look at me, wake up, church, nod your head, amen? You resist the devil and he won't bother you. I'm tired of temptation, preacher. I don't know what else to do. Put your face in the book and read it and get strong. Get stubborn. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter for the wages of sin is death. You can enjoy that sin for a season, but it's going to kill you. Whether it be physically, whether it be spiritually, you can enjoy that for a season, but the wages of sin is death. Amen. Take it to the bank. That's fact. That's truth. It's in my Jesus' word. It is there. It's going to happen. You can flirt with disaster all you want to flirt with it, but it's coming. Hearken unto me now, therefore, children. Therefore, O you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Don't say I didn't warn you. Don't say there wasn't a preacher stood in the pulpit at Oakdale Baptist Church who was given a message by an almighty God to forewarn you that the devil's tricks are coming. I read a sign on a church here a while back that said, uh, don't fall for the devil's tricks. It's like that little play on Halloween, you know, when fall coming and trick or treat. I thought it was cute. Didn't think much about it. It has soaked in. It has truly soaked in. Don't fall for the devil's tricks. That might be on Young's church sign. Is that where I read that at? That's what I thought it was there. It started cute in my mind. But God kept spinning them wheels. He kept showing me through scripture. He kept telling me. He kept speaking to me. There's more to that than just a little funny saying on a play on a season. There's more to that. Don't fall for the devil's tricks. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths. Bible teaches straight is the gate and narrow is the way, right? Amen. That's the only way into heaven, right? And you keep following Satan around, where's he going to lead you? Read on down. Read on down to verse or two. It says, her house is the way to hell. You follow the devil into his house, you keep following him, that's where it's going to take you. It's straight to the pits of hell. There is no other place that the devil knows how to go other than hell. And I don't care what he tells you. Let's read about what he tells you. John 8, 44, You are the father, ye are of your father the devil and the lust of your father of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Do you think he's going to tell you the truth about anything? Do you, was that the kind of person that you want to follow? Is that the kind of person you want to get your advice from? Is that the person that you want to listen to? Period. Is someone who wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him in the face. And don't think he don't know the scripture. You flip back over in here to Matthew. What did he tempt him with? You, you go in here uh, in verse 6. Is in, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. He knew a verse from back in Psalms. He knew that verse. And he told Jesus, Just jump down. You ain't going to get hurt. But what did Jesus say? It is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He used actual scripture. If you don't know the word, that's why it's key to study. It's key to study because the devil will use pieces. And he'll twist it. Amen. And he'll use it to his advantage. And if you don't know it, you won't think you're doing right. And what does the Bible also teach us about discerning the spirits? Because the good spirit ain't the only one out there, is it? We just read it in Ephesians. There's demons, powers and principalities of darkness, evil. You can watch all the horror movies you want and paranormal activity. No, I probably don't really believe in that, but I do believe in demons. I believe in evil spirits because they're going to tell you things. If they wasn't evil spirits, my Bible wouldn't say discern the spirits. Amen. Does that make sense? Does that hit home with you now? You've got to know who's speaking to you. When you read the Bible, you've got to know who's speaking because God's words ain't the only words that's in there. Amen? Amen? Other people speaks in the Bible. There's words that the devil used in there. 
just like here where he's tempting Jesus. He uses words that says, jump down. Everybody can read that and say, well, I can do whatever I want to and God will protect me. It's written in the Bible. Those are the devil's words. Amen. Don't fall for the devil's tricks. He's a father. He is a liar and the father of it. He ain't going to tell you the truth. He don't care about you. In the Gospels where Jesus went to pray in the garden, he took, what, three of his disciples with him. And he told them, he said, watch and pray lest you fall into, into temptation. That's what he told them, wasn't it? Amen. Watch and pray. And he went just a little bit farther in there, and Jesus prayed. And this is where you'll find in the Bible that Jesus prayed in such agony that his sweat became as uh, 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 drops of blood. You'll find that there. And he came back. And he said, what, could you not stay awake one hour? Watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. And he went back and prayed some more. And he come back. And what was they doing? They was tired. It had been a long day. They had a lot to soak in. Because in the, in, in the Bible, they just went, they, they had their last supper. And Jesus had told them that which one was going to betray him and the different things. They had a lot to soak in. They had a rough day. Say, well, could you not stay awake this long? Watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. What was they watching for? What was they praying for? What was the temptation that was going to come? I don't know. But Jesus said, watch and pray. You know what we're to watch for? His coming. Amen. You know what we're to pray for? His coming. So if we watch and we pray, unless we fall into temptation, you know what that means? If we spend our time watching for our Jesus to come, and we spend the majority of our time in prayer, we won't, be, we won't have time to be tempted, are we? Amen? If you spend more time worrying about God, in His things, in His work, and His doing, you have less time to worry about whatever thing looks pleasing in your sight. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 6, 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And that is the most important thing in which we've read thus far. It's praying in the Spirit. Because there's a difference in praying with your mouth and praying with your heart and praying with the Spirit, ain't there? Amen. Praying with our mouth, we're going to just pray for the things in which we want. But it's important to pray in the Spirit. Because we fight spiritual battles. And we know that our flesh is weak. We know that. We know that due to temptation that it is weak. But what must be strong to withstand the temptation? The Spirit. That must be strong. You must feed it daily. You must feed it more than once a day. It is important to feed the Spirit because that is where your strength will come from. Because the Holy Spirit is what's going to call into remembrance God's Word. It's going to call into remembrance this message. It's going to call into remembrance the words in which you have written, that you have read, the words that is written in this book. It's going to call into remembrance those things to keep you from falling into temptation. But if you do, you can land intact on the other side as long as you land on your knees in Jesus' arms. Amen? Amen? Is our God not a merciful God? Amen. Is he not a long-suffering, merciful, kind God Amen. who is always ready to forgive? Amen. Because we always need it. It's a good thing he's always ready to forgive because we always fall in short. Amen? 
Ain't none of us perfect. There is none good. No, not one. Not a one of us are righteous. If we was righteous enough to make it to heaven, then Christ came in vain. And God ain't no dummy. He knowed we couldn't do it. He knowed he had to send his son. Amen? Amen. We need him. Amen. But you know what the irony is? It's he needs us too. And I don't say that to puff you up and build you up with pride. I say that because he needs us to fulfill his commission and to spread his word, to be lights, to be examples. Let us stand together.